God, God loves you. He loves all of us, and he expresses that love through the truth of the Scripture, in particular about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he expresses his love in another way, and that's through each of us. And one thing we want you to, to experience more of today is God's love. So I want you just to turn to the person to the right or left of you and just tell them, God loves you so much. Tell them that, will you? Just tell the people next to you that. All right. Don't you feel better now? This makes you feel good. There's nothing like God's love. And he cares about us so much in the the death, burial, and resurrection speaks so, speak volumes about his love. And so we're going to think about that today. I don't know if you really realize, I think we take for granted the love that God has for us, in particular the love that he has already shown you. God has been guiding you. God has been leading you. You say, well, how, how do you know that, Mike? Because you're here today. Amen. Thank God that you didn't end up in a mosque today. There are over a billion people, that's a lot of people, who are Muslim. Lost, don't know the Lord, walking in darkness. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but through me. Thank God he didn't lead you to a mosque. You'd be lost if you, if you went that way. Thank God you didn't end up uh, at a Buddhist temple today or, or at a Hindu altar. There are over a billion people who are involved in Hinduism and Buddhism. Lost in darkness, don't know the Lord. If they were to die today, they would go to hell. We're talking about mamas and daddies and, and boys and girls and young people. But not you. You ended up here. Why? Because God has been leading you. Because God loves you and God cares about you. Now, I don't, I don't understand a lot of things about the way it works uh, pragmatically with people, but I, I do know this, and I believe this. I believe that, that if there's a person who is going to come to a place where they want to ask the Lord to come into their life to become a Christian, that God is going to go get that person. He's never going to lose any of those people. And so our prayer today is, is that if you haven't opened up your heart to the Lord. If you've never done that, if you've never said, God, I'm a sinner and I, I have broken your law and there's no other name by which I might be saved. There's no other door that I might go through. There's no other way that I can get to heaven but through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to invite him to come in my life. Our prayer is that you'll open up your heart even today to do that. Because it's not this building, it's not this building that God led you to, it's to this, this place where you can hear the Word of God, the truth of God, not a lie, not a falsehood. And boy, there's a lot of that out there in the world. Several billion people in the whole world are on the wrong road. And so we wanna, we wanna thank God. We don't wanna take for granted the fact that he has led us to the right road. And he not only knows how to lead us to the right road, but he knows how to keep us on the right road. I'm going to heaven someday, not because I'm holding on to him, but because he's holding on to me. Amen. And he knows how to hold on without letting go. And that's what he's been doing for me. And that's what he's doing for many of you. And that's exciting. Now today is really exciting. Now, you know, we have church, um, the first day of every week all throughout the year because they started beating. Uh, I started, you know, when, the, when the, the disciples got saved and then other people started asking the Lord to come to the light, they 
coming into their lives, they started coming out of the synagogue and started meeting in worship on the first day of the week, uh, partly because the synagogues, the Jewish people didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah, but the other part was that because Sunday was the day that the Lord, our Lord, rose from the dead. So we do that every day. But then on this particular time, this particular time of the year is sequenced to when Jesus was crucified on uh, Nisan the 14th on the Jewish calendar. And then that Friday night came, and then that Saturday, Saturday night, and then Sunday morning. And so on the Jewish calendar, that's the third day when the scriptures teach us that Jesus rose again from the grave. And so we have a, a little story of that uh, in John chapter 20 and verses 1 through 18. And some of our music uh, paralleled some of that. Uh, when uh, Jesus was taken down from the cross uh, by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, and they uh, uh, took care of him. They put about 100 pounds of spices and uh, wrapped him uh, to prepare him for his burial and had to take him from, down from the cross to do this and then put him into a, a, a burial tomb that Joseph of Arimathea owned that no one else had ever occupied before. Now, Elsa and I, we, we've been to Israel, and this place we believe that Jesus was crucified on is a place called Golgotha. It looks like a skull on the side of a cliff. We've been there, we've seen that, and it really looks like the, a, a skull. Not very far adjacent from that place uh, is a, some, a, a tomb that has been cut into the limestone. And you can actually walk into that place uh, today. Many people believe that this is where Jesus was buried. It's very uh, close and, and there wasn't a whole lot of time after Jesus died and then preparing the body uh, for them to bury Jesus. It had to be before six o'clock when the Sabbath started. So we believe that this is a very good likelihood that maybe Jesus was buried in this place. And so the disciples saw Jesus die. Uh, they saw uh, the scourging. They saw the trial. They saw the, uh, the verdict come down and carrying the cross down uh, via De La Rosa. And there he was crucified. They saw that. He stayed there. I was thinking about it Good Friday, you know, and, and maybe you were too, you know, at 9 o'clock our time uh, and going all the way to 3 o'clock. And I thought, man, that's a long time. Six hours to hang on a cross. But they, the disciples, they saw that. And, and so they saw Jesus die. And um, their, their hopes were dashed. It was, uh, they didn't understand. Jesus had already spoken to them about the fact that he's the resurrection, the life, that he was going to come back on the third day. He was going to be raised again in the light because he's God and to demonstrate and give evidence that he is God, which was the greatest evidence that he ever gave out of all the miracles that he did, is that he truly died, was buried, and rose again from the grave. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will build it, I will rebuild it in three days, speaking about his own body. The scripture says he told them all these things and they heard him, but they didn't really hear him. They heard him with their physical ears, but they didn't hear him with his, their spiritual ears. And we do that too, don't we? We've been through so many sermons and we've been to church and doing all those things. And sometimes it just gets mundane and we hear what God says through our physical ears, but we don't really hear it through our spiritual ears. We hear, we've heard it and we know that God says, don't worry, for example, but yet sometimes we go out and we worry. We choose to worry. And even though we're, because we're not really listening to what God says, that we ought to trust him for everything, that if we seek him first, that he will take care of all the other things in our life, that he will take care of all the things that are out of our control. And there's no need for us to worry. We've heard all that, but sometimes we don't hear God. And that was the disciples. They heard him, but they didn't really hear him. And so they, they were just in despair, in utter despair when Jesus died. And so Friday night passes, Saturday morning passes, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night passes, and then we come to Sunday morning, and that's where we pick up the story in John chapter 20. And you know the story, so I, I don't need to read the whole text to you again. You can read that uh, this afternoon if you'd like in the few minutes we have remaining. But when, when Mary Magdalene and, and Mary and her, and her sister from Salome, when they, when they went to the, the burial site 
and this, this, they, the, the burial site is, is, is cut into a limestone cone and there's a little track where the stone would be rolled to seal uh, that tomb. And Pontius Pilate also had a Roman guard to seal that tomb because the Pharisees were concerned that the disciples were gonna come and steal his body to say, how oh, yes, he, he really did what he said he was gonna do. But the, the, the disciples were pretty much in hiding at this point. The men were, not the women. The women were the courageous ones. And they decided to go to the tomb. They're, they're mourning, they're in grief. And when they went to the tomb, what did they find? They found an empty tomb. They found the stone rolled away. The guards were all gone. And they're, 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 in, they're in shock, okay? Because they came expecting death. They didn't come expecting an empty tomb. They were in utter despair. And so when they saw this, this empty tomb, they, they were just like astonished. It was just, just an incredible thing. This was just, this was awesome. They were dumbfounded because this is not what they were expecting which is one of the great, greatest evidences for the New Testament, for the fact that Jesus raised from the dead because the last people who expected Jesus to raise from the dead were his own disciples. And so when they saw the evidence for it, God changed their lives and they were not only willing to preach that message that Jesus was not only crucified but that he was risen from the dead and that he was alive, they were willing to die for it. But now these people are in hiding. They're all scared, they're afraid, except for the women. And so they come out. And so when, when, when they see this empty tomb, it's hard to find words that describe their experience. You know, surprised is not a good word. It's, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't meet expectations. In November of 1922, it was in Egypt, and it was 30 miles up the Nile River. And it was in the Valley of the Kings. The archaeological ruins at the center of Egyptian ancient civilization. And there was an archaeologist by the name of Howard Carter, 1922. And for 15 years, Dr. Carter had been looking for the tomb of King Tut. And at the end of the 15 years, he had two more months to go. He, was, he had two more, more months and that was it. He was out of money. And so it was do or die. He was at the end of his rope. And he was, he was getting ready to go home. He was putting everything back together. But then he just, he just started digging some more. And in the last two months in his digging, he found 16 steps that went down. He dug down those steps and then he found a long hallway about 60 feet long. And at the end of the hallway was a door. And this particular door in 1922 had not been opened for 3,200 years. So surprise is not really the word for Howard Carter. He decided that he would call his benefactor, who, who had uh, supported and financed the whole deal, to come over and to open the door with him. And so he had to wait six weeks for the benefactor to get there, which just about killed him. He finally showed up, and together they opened that door, and the door had the symbol of King Tut on it. And they opened up that door that had not been opened up for 3,200 years, and what they saw in there astonished them. Because the jewels and all the gold, the gold sarcophagus and the gold mask across King Tut's face, one of the most beautiful art pieces in the world was there. All his jewels. They had never seen such beauty in their life and they were totally astonished. They were, it was just an incredible find. They were, they were dumbfounded. It was just, just awesome that they found it, but they found a dead body after 3,200 years. And so that, what gets us maybe a little closer to trying to understand because, because the disciples didn't find a dead body. They didn't, they didn't find a dead Jesus. What gets us a little closer to this is in World War II in 1971 in Vietnam, 
uh, a bomb exploded and they couldn't find the remains of this young man, only his dog tags. And so they sent those dog tags to his mother and father back in the States. And they had the funeral for their son without a body. And his particular parents could not have any other children. This was their only child. And so they were grieving and they were mourning and just, just trying to bear with it. And the war ended. And then one afternoon, the phone rang. And the person on the other line said, Mom, this is your son. I'm coming home. She thought, this has to be some cruel joke, some hoax. And the voice said, no, Mom. It says, I was a prisoner of war. And after the war was over, they released me. And I want you to know, I'm coming home. That mother was astonished, was she not? This is not a dead body. This is a son that's coming back home. She was amazed. This was incredible. This is, this is awesome. Now maybe we're getting a little bit closer to what these ladies and what the disciples felt. As they came to that empty tomb, the Bible tells us that Mary when they, and the other ladies had seen it, that there were a couple angels there. There was one sitting on each end of where Jesus had been laid, his feet and his head, just, just like those two cherubim at both ends of the mercy seat on top of the Ark Covenant. And they said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And said, so he has risen. And so they left and they ran as fast as they could uh, to find Peter and John. And so they handed the baton off to them, and Peter and John ran back to the tomb. And, when, and John got there first, because he was, he was younger than Peter, and he stopped at the entrance of the tomb, but Peter just kept running right in. And there he saw something very interesting. He saw that the, 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 apron, the, the apron and, and what was, uh, had entombed Jesus was there and just perfect order. This was not the place of a, of a grave robber. And there his, his handkerchief, his, his handkerchief was there and the Bible tells us that it was folded. His napkin was folded neatly and in place. Now, in the first century, you know, the Lord had a message there for us. In the first century, when you would sit and you would eat, with your family or you would be over at a guest house and you had a host and you had servants and people that were waiting on you, maybe people, members of the family. If you got up from the table to excuse yourself, but you had planned to come back because you weren't finished eating and you would, you would neatly fold your napkin. But if you weren't coming back, if you were done, if you were finished, it was over with. You'd just throw your napkin down on the table and you'd leave. But if you weren't finished, if you were coming back, you would, you would take that napkin and you would just, and the servants, the host would know that you're not finished, that you're coming back. Don't put up the dishes yet. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell his disciples that day. I'm not finished with you. I'm coming back. Oh, man. Don't you know Peter and John, when they saw that, they were, what, surprised? Mm. Astonished dumbfounded. This is incredible. This is awesome what has happened to them as they have seen the Lord that day. And then the Bible tells us then, then the Lord shows himself a little bit later to all the disciples except for Thomas. And then Thomas comes and he shows up a little later and so what are you guys doing? And they said, we just saw the Lord. Where have you been? Oh no, you couldn't have seen him. And I won't believe unless I, what, stick my finger in there. So next, a week later, the Lord makes him wait a whole week. And then he reveals himself again to the disciples and Thomas sees him. And Jesus says, come over here to me and stick your finger over here on my side so you can see what's going on, son. And Thomas did so and he believed at that point and said, my kudos, my theos, my Lord and my God. The strongest statement of deity that we find in the New Testament about Jesus that a person can make. He began to understand who he was. I, I, I say all that to say as we begin to kind of wrap things up and, and, and close for today, that today, please don't take today for granted. 
because this event we're speaking about, which is spoken uh, probably uh, more so and described more so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 than in any other place in the Bible. That would be a great chapter for you to read some point this week. Don't take this day for granted because this day, this event that we are speaking about, when we speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is unique. Now, what do I mean by unique? The word unique means one of a kind. That means there is no second. There is no equal. There is no parallel. There is nothing similar. It is unique. It is one of a kind when we speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every single person that has lived on this earth and has died is still six feet under. Every, not, not some of them, not most of them, every single one except for two people, and they didn't die, and that was Enoch and Elijah because the Lord took them. But every person who's died, who lived on this earth and died, is six feet under the ground. That's where they are. There are no exceptions to that rule today. We have, what, six, seven billion people that live on this planet. In 100, 110, 115 years, every person that's alive today, barring the rapture, will be six feet under the ground. No exceptions. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. Every single person that's living today, barring the rapture, 100, 110, 115 years, that's a lot of people. They will all die. They will all go under the ground, Christian or non-Christian. There is only one person in 6,000 years of human history that died, lived on this earth, the God-man, the Lord Jesus, and died as a result of being on the cross and was buried, and on the third day rose again. His body is not six feet under. He's the only one. And that's why he is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father. He is saying that I am God. Now that same there, now we're going to close with this, that same resurrected life that's in him, that rose him from the grave, that, that ascended him back in heaven and seated him at the right hand of the Father, which is where he is today. That same life for every single believer today is in you. Is in you. Now, that, that, that's exciting. I mean, that's really exciting. I don't know how you describe that, but I wanna, I'm gonna try to do it here real quick. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says, uh, death is swallowed up in victory. And in the latter part of the chapter, it says, uh, oh death, where is your sting? What's he talking about? He's saying, well, when you die, you're gonna go to heaven. No, that's not what he's talking about. That's not the context. What he's saying is this, if you're a Christian, here's the way it works. If you're a Christian, you know the Lord, you've asked the Lord to come in your life, you have eternal life. So when you die, they put your body six feet under, but your spirit goes to heaven, okay? But at some point down the road, the rapture is gonna occur. When the rapture occurs, that's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, oh death, where is your sting? Because at that point, your body, which is six feet under, will not remain there anymore. It will be glorified, it will be raised up by God to meet you in heaven and God is going to give you your brand new spanking glorious body. And that's when you're gonna say, oh death, where is thou sting? Because you won't, your body won't be in the grave anymore. And this is the life, the resurrected life that the Lord has put in you. Now, now Paul said it this way. He said, I can't see, ear can't hear. We can't really understand how great it's going to be when we get into heaven. How do we describe it? Let me tell you how country folk will describe it when they get to heaven. Now, I don't know about the city folk, but here's how the country folk, this is what they'll say when they get to heaven. And they look around and they see the Lord and all of God's people and everything and all, they get all their glorious body back and all that stuff, all that stuff they're gonna say, holy cow. Amen. Amen. 
So listen, don't take today for granted. Wow, the Lord's alive. Judas wanna make sure that he's alive in you. Let's pray. You see, you wanna know that you know that you know that when you die, you're gonna go to heaven. You wanna know that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that he lives in your life and your sins are forgiven, canceled out, taken out, put as far as the east is from the west. You wanna make sure that you have a home in heaven and that when you die, when your heart stops, that the Lord's coming to get you and take you to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Are you sure about that? Do you know? Not hope so, think so, not maybe so, but do you know? You say, well, how do you do that? The, the Lord will only come into a person's life by invitation. He will never force himself into somebody's life. And so what the Lord has done today is he's presented the truth to you. It's not about joining the church. It's not about being good. It's not about being baptized. It's, no, it's about putting your trust, not in yourself, not in your works, but in the person of Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. You can do that right now. Here's what Jesus said. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, opens his heart, I will come into him. And when he does, he'll save you forever. Your sins will be forgiven forever. It won't make you perfect, not in this life, but it will in the next. But you will be forgiven. And God will come in your life and he'll change your life. And you will experience the love of God in a way that you never have before. Pray this prayer with me right now to the Lord, just between you and God. God's knocking on your heart. Open it up right now. Pray this prayer with me, dear Lord Jesus. Just say it to him. I believe that you are God. Lord Jesus, that you died on the cross for me. And then on the third day, you rose again, and that you're alive. You're alive today. Oh, but I'm, I'm a sinner. Lord, I know. I know that I've done wrong. I know that I've broken your law. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And right now, I invite you to come into my life. Lord Jesus, save me. Be my Lord. Make me a place in heaven with you in your house. And when I die, take me to heaven. But in this life, until I go there, make me the kind of person you want me to be. Live inside of me. Thank you. And if you prayed that prayer, praise the Lord. The Lord lives in your life now. And he'll never, ever leave you. And you can know for the rest of your life that on that Easter Sunday you prayed and you asked the Lord to come into his life, in your life and he kept his promise to you. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us, how you've led us to the right place. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.